So let's make a start. Oops. Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome back on this Friday to SOAS Festival of Ideas. Uh, my name is Dr. Alberto Fernandez Carvajal. I'm senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Roehampton in Southwest London. And I'm very delighted to be talking to you today on this second panel on the topic of colonialism, education and sexualities. And to introduce the three speakers that, that will be uh, talking, talking to us today who come from a wide range of perspectives from the world of publishing to the world of academia. So welcome to our three speakers. I like how, uh, how diverse we are in terms of people's, people's uh, perspectives and occupations as well. And we start with Arpita Das, who um, uh, is in charge of Yoda Press. She's the founder publisher of the award-winning independent publishing house uh, press, which is based in New Delhi. She runs the Yoda Press series of workshops for editors and authors, and has been visiting faculty with a creative writing program at Ashoka University in New Delhi. Um, she's going to be uh, the first one, the first panelist talking to us today. So I'd like to give her a warm welcome and I'll give her a round of digital applause. So if, if you'd like to, uh, if the other panelists would like to join us. Uh, oh, there is no, no applause uh, um, option. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. So feel free to, um, to start your paper. Um, I, I can't seem to start my video. It says the host up. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to put my video off in a couple of minutes, though. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, thank you, SOAS Festival of Ideas. SOAS is my alma mater from years and years ago, so this is particularly uh, special for me. And I'm joining you from New Delhi. It's half past seven, and I have a GNT by my side. Uh, and I'm going to get started with um, a few slides. Um, essentially, I suppose I'm not, I'm the only one who's not an academic here and I'm talking really about a large part of my life, which has been, um, you know, publishing the LGBTQIA list at Yoda Press in India, in South Asia. Uh, I can say South Asia because even today, I think I can safely say it's, um, uh, it's it's the only list dedicated sexualities list in all of South Asia. So I'm just going to share my screen so that uh, just give me a second. Can you, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, it was really started as a list. The LGBTQIA list was started as a list um, and it then morphed into a series which was called the sexuality series at Yoda Press. And then it morphed back into a list. Um, and I think when we started, which was back in 2005, um, it was a year into uh, Yoda Press's life as it were, as an independent publishing house based in New Delhi, India. Um, I mean, these were the various challenges that sort of, you know, um, that we, we confronted and which were really quite, sort of um, uh, monumental at that point for us um, because um, uh, some of the stuff we just didn't know what we could possibly do uh, anything about. And of course, um, you know, the section 377 sort of Democles sword was hanging over everyone's head who wanted to really talk about um, this issue, this phenomenon and, uh, and, the, and the burgeoning movement. And the fact of the matter is that um, being in India and being in South Asia, for those of you 
who are familiar with South Asia, a lot of it is extremely sort of, um, you know, okay, kosher when it's not being discussed. But the minute people try to talk about certain things which are not considered socially acceptable or, um, you know, uh, want, to, want to sort of uh, bring something into the spotlight, things start getting unpleasant. And that is how I think a lot of the confrontations with Section 377, which is sort of lain dormant for a very, very long time, because as some of you know, this was, this was a colonial uh, law. This was uh, something that was uh, seamlessly taken into our constitution from the colonial era. And it, of course, criminalized homosexuality. So the legal fight was really against that, but then the social and the cultural fight as some of you can imagine, was even more monumental in the sense, and I think we are facing that still a lot, um, because of course this was not going to change overnight, neither was it going to change with a change in law, it, it's not like throwing a switch. And um, what made it more uh, difficult for us also um, in the movement was that at that point at least the LGBT community was not seen as either a vote bank or a lobby. And I think a lot of that has changed in the past 16 years, but at that time, um, you know, the invisibilization in a sense was complete. There are many sections of the LGBT community today which are still invisibilized, but at that point it was fairly complete. Um, and of course, you know, for me as a publisher who was also doing a lot of academic publishing, whose mainstay at that point at least was uh, academic publishing, um, what was really also important was that there were no sexuality studies at all in that time um, in India. Um, I'm sorry, I, one second, that was too quick. And the uh, more occupational hazard, as it were, was that um, nobody really saw the LGBT community at that point as a viable author pool. And frankly, when we first started, um, a lot of bookstores refused to keep copies of this book. Now, this book has become, um, came out in 2005. It's become a bit of a cult sort of text for um, LGBT studies, sexuality studies from South Asia. And, um, uh, and indeed, we had the situation, uh, you know, that um, uh, bookstores actually said they would not keep copies of this book. And I tell the story again and again, but I never tire of telling it how um, all of us, uh, the publishing publishers, which was me and my partner, really my business partner, and, um, and the contributors and the editors got together. And we just all started visiting the bookstore asking for this book. So there were, it was an anthology, there were a lot of contributors. So we had about 25 people visit the bookstore over two days. And after that, we got a call from the bookstore saying they wanted to uh, 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 order copies. And then of course the rest is history because this book has really taken on, a, a, as I said, a sort of a cult kind of, importance in, um, in LGBT studies in India. And I think one of the most important things that we did with this book was that we decided that we were not going to anonymize the authors. There had been a couple of books before this, but either they were in the realm of short stories and fiction, or they had left the names anonymous. And when we went about commissioning for this book, we were very clear that we wanted to A, not fictionalize, and a large part of this book had to be the lived experience of the LGBT community. Um, and second, that no one got to go as anonymous. Um, uh, you know, you might think at this point that it's really rigid, it was a rigid sort of a rule and that agency was hampered in some way, but trust me at that point where we were, it was really important for us to put everybody's name out there um, as a community, as a political commu part of the community and say that the book is their book and their voice. Um, and, you know, um, I think the book continues to remain in print even today and it's a really, really important book for us. Um, but effecting um, genuine sort of transformation um, took a fair amount of time, of course, and I think 
um, so for some of you who are aware of the way the, the, the LGBT movement has moved in India, what became fairly clear very quickly was that 377 had to be read down. Article 377 had to go. And um, this book of ours was, uh, uh, was, was sort of laid out the entire um, uh, discussion around why 377 had to go. And a lot of the to, contributors to this book were actually part of the legal team that, that fought the case um, in first the Delhi High Court and then the Supreme Court of India. And of course, that very interesting thing happened where the Delhi High Court read the um, uh, read the Article 377 down. It, it decriminalized homosexuality in 2009. And then a couple of years after that, Supreme Court um, pretty much dismissed that judgment of the Delhi High Court. So it was fairly clear to us at that point with such a setback, and it was fairly clear to us that more literature had to go out about the community, about the movement. And um, at this point, another thing that was very, very, becoming very, very clear to us was um, that there wasn't enough being written about the trans community in India. And um, ultimately, um, as, some, as, as many of you will be aware, in uh, two years ago, um, the Supreme Court did do away with Article 377 and homosexuality was decriminalized. Um, but before that, um, a few years before that, uh, there was another mammoth and very, very important um, uh, judgment by the Supreme Court of India, which recognized transgender persons in India for the first time. And this was, you know, in, 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 the, in the discussions around the LGBT movement in India, this, this particular judgment is not spoken about a lot, uh, but, but it was equally important um, because, of course, the transgender community, um, uh, as part of the large spectrum of the LGBTQIA um, community in India, it often uh, uh, comes come from uh, marginalized and and unprivileged backgrounds, and their fight, in a sense, is is very different from the fight of many others who are part of this community, and um, this particular. Um, uh, Supreme Court judgment was therefore extremely important. Um, what was really uh, particularly, um, you know, a victory for us, because of course you can imagine the, 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 the difficulty in sort of selling these books, continuing to find markets for these books. Although I must say that a lot of our market for these books uh, of, uh, is, is, comes from international sources and uh, comes from sexuality studies departments in various universities across the world. Um, but what was really fantastic is that um, five of our titles were cited in both of these Supreme Court judgments. And uh, that felt like playing a really, really sort of vital and genuine part in uh, effecting change in this uh, matter. Um, a lot of people meet me after, post the 2018 judgment and decriminalization of homosexuality to ask me what is it like now to be publishing on sexuality and to be sort of uh, producing knowledge on sexuality in South Asia. And I think um, in a lot of ways, um, there is new impetus to recognize a lot of issues and a lot of discussions which had gone somewhat unnoticed earlier. Uh, Loving Women Being Lesbian in Unprivileged India is this, was this book we had published back in 2007. Um, and um, at that point I felt, you know, it didn't really get the kind of sales or accolades it deserved considering the author uh, did a marvelous job of recording and documenting stories of women living with women and women loving women in unprivileged India. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, after the lockdown began, this fantastic platform called Agents of Ishq uh, got in touch with us and they asked us if they could turn uh, stories, the narratives from uh, loving women into comic narratives, into graphic narratives and share them. And it has given this 
whole new life to this wonderful book and um, made me very hopeful of, uh, uh, about where my backlist still stands, even though um, you know, things have changed so much. Um, but at the moment, um, what, what we're looking for now is really that, you know, a lot of people will ask us, so is, is it still queer writing or is queer writing um, somewhat, you know, restricting a label and you want to look at it just as writing? And um, very often I feel that, you know, well, it cuts both ways. And the fact of the matter is that at one point it was really, really important to talk about it as queer writing. Um, but then, of course, it is understandable that particularly writers, creative nonfiction or creative fiction, want to be known as writers as well. And I think uh, as we stand now, I think these are the things I keep in mind when I'm talking about, when I am commissioning for this list now, um, that it is going to be queer writing as a whole in, in, you know, as I'll always see it. But I also want to think of it as queer, uh, uh, um, queer characters or queer narratives as part of a book on fiction or as a part of a book on poetry or as part of a book on business or on, or on, or, or on travel, perhaps. And I think both have to uh, coexist side by side. Um, obviously, we need many, many more books by women in the LGBTQIA community. Uh, I think a lot of standout books have been by men, uh, popular academic fiction, and I think this needs to change from South Asia. Um, a particular interest for me now is to see if there is there are possibilities to commission books by trans men, because the few trans narratives that have been told uh, by members of the trans community have been those of trans women. And I think trans men, um, they still need to tell their story. Um, the other important thing is a lot of this, uh, I mean, what we've noticed is, of course, the original English language writing, and particularly in, when we talk about academic writing, it's mostly always English language. Of course, that's there and that exists and that's important. But the fact of the matter is that translations of stories coming in from Indian languages and not just into English, but from one Indian language to another. I think that kind of crossover, that kind of exchange needs to happen in a big way. But I think the most important thing that I would flag is to end my presentation is um, unless our editorial ecosystem in the publishing houses in India changes, unless it becomes more diverse, um, we're not going to be doing any of this genuinely. And I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter, for, uh, for your presentation. We'll have so much to talk about. So interesting, all the stuff that you've done. And uh, so many people are so beholden to the work that you do. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, next in line, because we don't want to lose any time so that uh, we can discuss afterwards as much as we can. Uh, next in line, if I can get my, oops, if I can get my screen up is, oops, oops, sorry about this. Oh. Oh, I've lost the, I've lost the, oh, da, 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 da. Give me a, oh here it is. So next in line is uh, Rhoda Reddock, who's an Emerita Professor of Gender, Social Change and Development and the former Deputy Campus Principal of the University of the West Indies in the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. She's um, an activist in the Caribbean women's movement. She has been for many years and she's currently in the executive committee of the International Sociological Association and many other, I mean, lots of accolades, a very, um, uh, a very well seasoned academic in the field. So we're going all the way from South Asia, all the way from, from India to the Caribbean across many, many time zones. And we really look forward to welcoming Rhoda. So Rhoda, um, the floor is yours. Rhoda, are you with us? You might have to unmute yourself and turn the camera on. It, it seemed the camera was turned on. 
were turned off. So the host will have to. Okay. You're back. Excellent. Yes, it's back now. Over okay. to you. Yes, good morning and thanks very much for having me. Uh, I speak as a feminist scholar activist located in the Global South, specifically Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And uh, of course, this is a very small place. And in particular, uh, my work circulates around the Anglophone Caribbean, although some of my work also has wider and broader application. Now, it has tended to be quite eclectic, uh, ranging from the broad areas of women's labor and social movement history, feminist theory, the gender implications of global economic development, intersections of class, gender, race, class, ethnicity, and citizenship, uh, radical social thought, including radical feminist thought, Caribbean feminist thought, gender and environment, gender, and gender sexualities and identities, and Caribbean masculinities. So you'll see that uh, my work on uh, gender and sexualities is often integrated into other fields, other areas, although I have done some specific work in this area, which I'll discuss this morning. Now, my positionality and experiences, therefore, would be quite different from some of my colleagues located in the North and I hope to explore some of these. Now, before going further, uh, I wanted to differentiate between the terms colonization and colonialism, because colonization usually refers to the action or the process of settling and establishing control over an area. Uh, often it means control over the people who are indigenous to that area or in areas that have not been uh, entered into before, clearing lands and establishing a dominant presence that was not there before. Now, colonialism, on the other hand, I understand as a policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over any country, occupying it with settlers, exploiting it economically, etc. So colonization usually precedes colonialism, and the Caribbean has been both colonized and experienced colonial rule from various European powers since 1492. And therefore the Caribbean was that first place of significant European conquest, colonialization, sorry, colonization, colonialism, and large scale transportation and varying levels of forced and coerced migration and labor. Now, uh, <clears throat> much of our activist work and academic work, therefore, at this time, continues to involve challenging and removing, amending colonial sexist, racist, colonialist laws, practices, ideologies, and religious systems introduced through the colonial process, and continued today through the continued dominance of Euro-America, including Euro-American religious uh, missionary work in the region. Now, the, the Caribbean region, in a way, possibly like all other colonial regions, has been sexualized since the 15th century. And of course, in the specific format of the systems of enslavement, it's interesting, as shown in some of my early work on women and slavery in the Caribbean, that for at least two, 300 to 400 years of enslavement, marriage and the establishment of family units was not allowed. And slave plantation, on slave plantations, childbearing was also discouraged and unions could be destroyed through sale. And therefore you have there the, the, the framework for the construction of specific forms of gender relations and also relations of sexualities. I think what is also important is that the, the free control and access that European men had to enslaved women. And in fact, if one were to read the work of Thomas Thistlewood, who was a Jamaican uh, overseer, uh, we would argue that the work, the behave, sexual behaviors of these overseers actually became the model for sexual behaviors 
in the region at a later date, but that is an issue for further discussion. Now, research on sexualities in the Caribbean prior to the 1990s was mainly demographic studies, studies on population control, et cetera, but the HIV AIDS pandemic really opened up the possibility for funding and access to resources to begin to carry out work on sexualities, possibly for the first time in that kind of in-depth way. Because as you may know that for many parts of our region, a lot of our funding, research funding comes through development funding. So that the, the, the luxury sometimes of selecting our areas of research uh, could be affected by the abil abil availability of funds and a climate within such which such work could take place. So it was during the, the HIV AIDS pandemic that my work on gender and sexualities began. Uh, I, with our team, we explored the sexual cultures of the, of the region, in particular, how sexualities are constructed and expressed within the unequal gender relations. We were concerned about how rigid sex and gender stereotypes deepen vulnerability, undermine sexual autonomy and personal security and integrity. And uh, we went deeper in, our, in, in exploring our work. We stumbled upon an area that we really had not considered. And that was a taboo area of child sexual abuse, particularly intrafamilial sexual abuse referred locally as incest. Stakeholders and practitioners in health, gender, HIV, women's movement activists, social workers, et cetera, reporting on the high prevalence in the communities that within which we work. And we know also that this is a global phenomena. A uni 2012 UNICEF study um, identified sexual violence against children as 7% for boys, so about 73 million globally, 14% for girls, 150 million globally below, below the age of 18 years had experienced forced sexual intercourse and other forms of sexual violence. And that 21% of women in some countries reported being sexually abused before age 15. And it was on that background that we began to explore the, the gendered and the structural underpinnings beneath that practice and to try to understand ethnographically what were the factors that contributed to its existence. And of course, we took a clear feminist and gender perspective, which varied from the public health approaches that had been used before. And we're able to conclude that child sexual abuse in the Caribbean is clearly located within a context of gender ideologies and expressions sexual expectations and behaviors and social norms based on patriarchal values, where women and girls continue to have the main responsibility to establish boundaries, including physical boundaries to protect themselves. At the same time, we found that the attitudes and behaviors of men and older boys, including family members, reflected a strong sense of sexual entitlement among older boys and men. And many of the same factors that gave rise to other forms of gender-based violence. For example, unequal power relations, economic dependence were also contributing factors. The research also supported other studies that argued that children's vulnerability makes them like women, targets of abusive masculine sexual assertions. And the, that the decision to disclose publicly came with significant burdens for children in relation to family honor economic sustainability, sorry, stigma and social judgment. We found discomfort among boys in speaking about sexual abuse uh, because our, the mainstream gender ideologies constructed men as active and normally heterosexual sexual beings who should accept all available sexual opportunities. So refusing sexual opportunities from women, whether consensual or not, could be construed as a sign of homosexuality. Similarly, rape by men would also be similarly understood. Boys and men were therefore unwilling to speak about their experiences of these phenomena. 
a more recent work by one of our colleagues among Indo-Caribbean male concluded that homophobia presents them, prevents them from speaking out about their abuse, shifting the discourse from the abuse to their sexuality. Now, the meanings and therefore attached to masculinity and family have important implications for this phenomena. And we, this was an action research study, which was linked to a campaign, which continues. Um, we also, at the same time, did another two other studies on youth sexual cultures. And uh, we looked at youth sexual cultures on the campus of our university, but also in the streets during a street ethnography in the capital city. And we came up with many interesting conclusions related to notions of sexuality, gender identity, and suggested a greater fluidity that is normally uh, understood. And one of the important components of this study was to challenge many the, the binary divisions structures that are commonly understood. So in my most recent work on gender variance, I challenged many of the common assumptions about sex gender normalcy at ex it examined the concepts of sex gender identity, diverse gender expression, and gender variations or diversity, as well as the different ways in which these are experienced cross-culturally. Generally, in this discourse and in everyday understandings, sorry, generally in everyday understandings, uh, masculinity and femininity, male and female, are understood as binary opposites. To be masculine is to be not feminine. To be male is to be not male. Hence the discomfort we have with, with, uh, with ambiguity. And now, and so we began by acknowledging these hegemonic gender divisions. Uh, but we also noted that although these are strongly held in Euro-American traditions and some others, they do not reflect the complexity of the human sex gender experience. Indeed, many African, Asian, Pacific, and indigenous and pre-Columbian American societies had developed different gender categories and understandings in this regard. Nevertheless, there's a hegemonic construct, uh, which I think we need to integrate with our own, with the other understandings to really get to the breadth and complexity of this phenomena. I also note the historic irony that while the contemporary challenge to homophobia and heteronormativity has been most visible in the North Atlantic world, it was European colonialism that demonized and marginalized many forms of sexual and gender variation found in other parts of the world. In virtually every part of the non-Western world that European colonialists and their missionaries entered, they vilified, attacked, criminalized, demonized, pushed underground, and eventually closeted or made disappear existing forms of sex vendor variation. The reality, though, is much of this survived, uh, but not always in a form that allowed it to, to be, to be uh, a full expression, especially with colonial laws, uh, which criminalized certain practices and which continue to be on the legal books of some of our countries and protected by savings clauses that were in the law that were established at the point of independence. So our work on gender, and, my work on gender and sexualities therefore has sought to understand its complexity and to, to free it from some of the constructs which I feel have been imposed against and to ask that Northern and Southern scholars uh, may look at each other's work in this area to really bring about a fuller understanding. Uh, it's also been important in a, it's also been important in developing new strategies for how freedom and liberation uh, should look. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rhoda. Very exciting as well. Can't wait to uh, talk to you about all these things. 
So last but not least, the person mm -hmm. who actually originally <laughs> volunteered to go first, never mind. Uh, we're going a bit further north. We're going to uh, Boston uh, and uh, we're welcoming Yoti Puri, who's a Hazel Dick Leonard Chair and also Professor of Sociology at Simmons University in Boston. Um, her interests revolve around issues of sexuality, gender, race, nation, and state as well, from a transnational and post-colonial feminist lens. Uh, she's written uh, a number of books, uh, many, many books, so, uh, so I do ask you to have a look at her bio note to take a note of them. Um, otherwise, I just can't wait to hear what she's got to say. So uh, thank you so much, Yoti. Alberto, thank you so much. I can't turn on my video, so I wonder if somebody, um, it says that it's stopped by the host. Okay, I'm all set. Thank you again. Um, thank you so much also to Professor Amina Yakin, Stephanie and others who've been part of organizing this particular panel. Um, and a warm welcome to all of you, I believe that are people from virtually all around the world who've joined in. Um, but I have to say, I'm thinking nostalgically about being in London and I feel like if I squint my eyes just so I can pretend like I'm there. Um, but onto the um, topic in terms of, I think this issue around decolonization, the thematic, it's for me, it has been helpful to think about it across um, the terrain of sexua uh, sexualities, which is sort of primarily what I work on, but also the discipline of sociology, which is my home discipline, as well as my pedagogy, you know, in terms of the courses and the approaches that I take to the courses. So I want to be able to think across all of that. But the question that I want to begin with is what is decolonization? because it's a term that we use quite widely and quite broadly. And it's a term that has gained renewed currency in the last 15, 17 years. So in one sense, we know about decolonization as um, a process that was historical, political, that required the withdrawal of colonial powers, um, independence, sovereignty, much in the ways that Professor Reddick was just talking about in terms of um, colonial rule, right? So sort of the end of that, the formal end of it. Um, and since then, and possibly even before then, um, this question about what it means to decolonize thought, what it means to decolonize curriculum has been a question that has been taken up by many educational centers and universities in the global south for many years now. But as I said, um, particularly in the last 15, 17 years, the term seems to have gained renewed currency, especially via the influence of what, what is called decoloniality. It's an area of thought led by people like Walter Mignolo and others from Latin America, which was about um, disentangling knowledge and epistemologies um, of the global south from their European um, sources, right? To sort of to disentangle that, to think about sort of legacies of thought and knowledge systems that were pre-colonial or that existed alongside colonialism without ever being fully co-opted by them. Um, and at the same time, decolonization is a term that is used just very broadly. A few years ago, somebody pointed me to the site called Decolonize Yoga, right? So we talk about decolonizing this, we talk about decolonizing that, we talk about decolonizing yoga. And when I look at that particular site, it frankly, I'm not quite clear what that means. Um, you know, what that sort of, how that framework is being used. So when I think about it, sort of the, when I place it in this particular context, um, and I think about my work, um, the research that I've done, the writing that I've done, as well as the courses um, that I've taught over the years, for me, decolonization has meant contending with geopolitical conditions, um, colonialism, its legacies, but also slavery, imperialism, transnational migration, all of these geopolitical conditions that produced the very notion of Europe or the United States, which is where I'm based, and its others. 
Um, it has also, decolonization for me has also meant developing and using critical tools, critical epistemologies that decenter Europe and the United States, that they are not at the, that they are not the reference point of our knowledge systems. Um, I wish my, I've uh, sought to produce new genealogies of the global south, critical genealogies of the global south, particularly through the lens of sexuality. And now I'm currently working on a project on death and migration so that, you know, that endeavor continues. And also, um, and this is the last thing I want to make, the point that I want to make about decolonization, I think it also is important that we understand Europe and the United States afresh. So to decolonize means to also um, understand the United States and um, Europe from these critical perspectives. Um, and here I think the term or the phrase that Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak has used calling Europe an other, right? So it's, it's an other and it deserves to be placed again within that position of just another. And so I find that very helpful in terms of thinking afresh about um, the place of Europe as well as the United States. So with that, I wanna actually speak for a few minutes about my discipline of sociology. And um, since I'm based in the United States, I'd like to actually share with you briefly what this discipline means from the perspective of the American Sociological Association, which is um, the premier um, national or organization. And here are, um, sorry. Um, I'm not sure why I'm not being able to make this full screen, but just give me a second and I think I can figure that out. Um, hmm. I don't know if it has something to do with the, um, yes, anyway, but I hope you can see it. So this is the American Sociological Association. And on the left um, of the screen is um, the 2019 statement which defines it as the study of society, a social science, um, the study of behavior, the scientific study of social aggregations, and overarching unification of all studies, right? Um, and in, nine, in uh, 2020, they had changed the definition, and now it reads about the study of social life, social change, um, you know, the structure of organizations, groups, um, it ranges from the study of the intimate family to the hostile mob. It's about divisions of race, gender, and social class to the shared beliefs of a common culture. So I can just give you another couple of seconds to read this, to just go over the two definitions. I know there's a lot of text in there. The point that I want to make over here is that while there is much to be said about these definitions and you know one can go uh, in depth in terms of the analysis, what they are not about is engagement with power in a sustained, systemic, concentrated way. It's not about the politics of knowledge, right? And it's not addressing, neither of these statements address geopolitical formations head on. And so as a result, in order to think about how does one decolonize disciplines such as sociology, it seems to me that one has to turn outside of these of a discipline like this to turn to critical post-colonial and transnational feminist thought, to black feminist scholars um, like Professor Reddick, to indigenous studies, um, uh, in order to find our sources of inspiration, in order to find examples of this kind of critical thought. Um, a black sociologist, Joyce Ladner, published The Death of White Sociology back in 1973. So in terms of decolonizing our disciplines, we have inspiration, we have sources 
the ground for this has already been cleared. Moving on to research, I want to make a couple of points in terms of my own research, which has been concentrated primarily in terms of sexuality, um, as well as gender, uh, nation, state, and so on and so forth. Sexuality has been crucial to the very projects of colonial rule and occupation. And for that matter, slavery, settler colonialism, but also to what then emerges as the post-colonial. And in my work, um, I've looked at um, middle and upper class women, for example, in urban centers like Bombay and New Delhi. Um, and this work was done in the late 1990s. And it was really at that point, um, it became important to me to study what women from these the relatively privileged classes, the upper, the middle and the upper middle classes, you know, their narratives, their influences around gender and sexuality, because the bulk of the literature at the time coming through the discipline of anthropology and its colonial legacies, the, the primary focus had been on rural women on what we call, quote unquote, studying down, studying the less privileged because researchers have access to them. And so for me, it was important to shift that perspective and to study groups that in fact had not been studied precisely because of the privilege that they occupy. Another major project that I did um, also relates to what Arpita was talking about in terms of the struggle to decriminalize homosexuality and the book, um, Sexual States, which came out in 2016, one of the sort of the key projects that was motivating this book, this research and this study was not only to map the struggle around the decriminalization of homosexuality and its various complexities, but also to make the point that contexts such as India or other places in the global South are not just cases, but that these are sites of theory production, right? Because conventionally we look to places like the United States or Europe as the sources of theory and theory production, and then everything else becomes a case. But um, along with other scholars, my project has been to overturn this and to think about India and this particular struggle as a site of theory and theory production. Um, but it's also about paying attention to post-colonial context, it, it, you know, for India, where I have been working primarily, which is the ways in which entire communities, entire marginalized communities are at risk because of the rise and the increasing ascendancy of Hindu fundamentalism, right? That too, taking on the, the, the structures and the formations of Hindu fundamentalism, that too, is part of this project of decolonization. And it's not simply about the colonial and the colonized or the um, ex-colonial ex, uh, and the post-colonial, but it's also about the rise of these um, right-wing structures and the, the power and the formation um, that has been really impacting the landscape so widely. And then lastly, it's about our readings, our framings, our methodologies, who we are reading, how we propose our research, who we are citing, um, you know, which conferences we attend. All of this, it seems to me, is part of this question about how do we decolonize knowledge? How do we decolonize our academic and activist practices? And lastly, a couple of quick points about teaching. Um, it seems to me that sociology as we know it, but this is true of other disciplines as well, this problem is hardly one that is pertinent only to sociology. But I think these disciplines that tend to be so Euro-American centric, they persist because of how we perform them. And we perform them in all of these quotidian ways. I think about it in terms of the iterative practices of teaching, right, um, our syllabi, um, who's in our reading list, how we educate and inform students about methods, the practices, right, through which we perform these disciplines, but also that these practices 
have room in order to allow us to disrupt these disciplines, to change them in fundamental ways to decolonize them. And I've taken on some of these right from my syllabi in terms of introduction to sociology, to methods, to theory courses, to think carefully about what that decolonizing project would look like. And um, it's a project that is ongoing because I'm not sure we ever fully arrive at the point where we can be complacent about all of this. So with that, I'm going to stop right here and I look forward to um, the discussion and um, the comments and the feedback. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yoti. Another very, um, very thought provoking and very, very um, um, exciting paper as well. So, so you, gosh, you've given all of us so much to think about. Can I invite the rest of the speakers to, uh, to come back on camera and to turn the, turn the microphones back on so we can have a kind of plenary discussion amongst all of us? Hello, hello. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think the host, yeah, okay. Got it. You're coming out of the shadows, huh, Peter. Uh, there okay, you are. Okay, got it. Okay, excellent. I mean, I mean, so many different. Um, you're working on so many on such different areas, and yet, I could see the topic of colonialism and education and uh, and the and decolonization. You know, running across uh, your three presentations. Um, and I and I just you know I've got pages and pages, but uh, I guess I want to start by asking you all a question. That you might want to, you know, throw throw to one another and and debate amongst yourselves, um, because so much of of coloniality is so uh, woven around issues of language as well, um, particularly when we're talking about people's identities. So um, um, Jyoti was talking about, you know, using ideas that are not um, Euro American in inception, look, looking for different sources of, of thought. What about the very terms that we use to describe LGBTIQ uh, citizens from around the world? Uh, I mean, this is English, it's the, it's the primal colonial language. Um, it, it, um, Arpita, you had me thinking when you said, you know, we need trans men to be more, have more visibility. And I thought, but who counts as a trans man in India? Because some of the Hishra community, are, uh, could 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 perhaps be considered trans men, but many not many not. Uh, they're intersex or the or the uh, um, cross dressers as well. So um, so my question to you is about language and about concepts and how can we decolonize the study of sexuality around the globe um, without doing epistemic violence to the people that we're trying to champion, without you know labeling people very rigidly and imposing a westernized understanding of their identities. Very big question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Like uh, if I can just come in on the trans men bit, um, you know, there's there's actually a very very um, dynamic, politically active trans men community in India um, who recognize themselves and identify as trans men, and as a matter of fact, that has become a particularly important point of discussion in publishing circles, at least a kind of activist publishing circles, which are important to me, because um, uh, two years ago, or, uh, early last year, early 2019, um, there was a book published by Penguin India uh, on trans men, which, um, you know, where a journalist um, engaged uh, members of the community in conversations. And even before the book came out, um, uh, there was large scale protests from among the trans men community against this book um, because some of the advanced proofs leaked out to um, the trans men community. As a matter of fact, one of the most important um, activists from the community, G. Iman Semalar, uh, who was actually interviewed in the book, um, then said that, you know, the way uh, they, he had then been portrayed and the way things were taken out of context uh, was extremely objectionable to him. And I think um, it got us all thinking about the fact that uh, the community has to tell its own story first. And, and that is an important, very, very vital part of the discussion for publishers like me, 
in India right now. Just, just to put that. Thank you so much for that. Really, really interesting. Anybody want to respond? Well, Pedro, I think it's a really important and I would say a complicated question, the question about language. Um, you know, in one sense, sort of English or for that matter, Spanish or French, these are languages that have been clearly bestowed as a result of colonial rule. At the same time, in, in a place like India or South Asia at large, it's been around for 200 years. So it's very much a language that belongs to us alongside other languages. Part of the problem with English in the context of South Asia is that it is still the language of the elite. It is still the language of um, you know, the sort of um, the privileged, right? It is the language of governance, which is not always open to other people. And then it also, English becomes the reference point by which, you know, for which we then have this notion of the vernacular, right? So that there is a hierarchy of languages that is developed. So I think to me, that's the more uh, critical, complicated terrain not so much about whether we can use words like LGBTQI, hijra, transgender, you know, that to me is not as important because identities are dynamic, um, they are constantly shifting, being produced within social political context, and there's nothing static about that, there's nothing static about language for that reason, right? Um, so to me, I think I would rather, um, you know, raise the question about the primacy of English and the way it articulates with um, regional difference and class difference and status difference. Thanks ever so much. Um, Rhoda, would you like to respond? Yes, I think that this, this question is really the issue that I was trying to work with in that I do think that what we, that a lot of the way in which the discourse has emerged has been in a way, almost a quantitative kind of accounting kind of approach. So that, uh, so, but I think that, that a, a lot of these, I think it doesn't allow for the wealth of variation that exists and also the variation in relation to identity and then the variation in relation to physicality and bodies and how the two things intersect. So I prefer to think of them as continua that intersect at various points and then identities emerge based on social, historical or other circumstances and also there are different ways in which societies have understood, for example, just the, I'm on the CEDAW committee and, uh, and one of the, this, this year the Pakistan delegation turned up with a transgender woman on their, uh, as part of the delegation. They were very proud of it. In fact, it was, uh, I, they sent, we sent a line after that, transgender person on Pakistan delegation to the UN CEDAW committee. And uh, of course, there were other um, Islamic countries around who were horrified and shocked. They could not believe this. But my understanding is that the whole way in which that is conceptualized and understood in Pakistan has, is, you know, there's a long, deep history that's very different from other parts of the world. And I think also the ways in which it's understood uh, would be quite different from certain circumstances. So I do think that the, the putting together the actual experiences is very important. Or similarly in our interviews with, uh, with trans women in Trinidad also suggested a lot of variation. They spoke about their relationships with women and these were sex workers on the street. They spoke about how even though they're trans trans women, they, they saw other women still treat them as men and insist. So for example, if somebody's coming to attack 
they still expect the trans women to be the ones to defend them. And if anything happens to the trans men, they are left defenseless. So they, they also spoke about the different ways in which they relate to women sexually, because even though they were trans women, they still had sex. So what you found is that there's a complexity of experience that I think cannot always be, be, be clearly uh, either say, okay, this is this and that is that. I think a lot of it has to do with the circumstances, the history and the, the whole understandings in that particular context. So I, I think that yes, there are categories that are important that we use, but I think we also have to use this in the recognition that, that uh, there is, the situation is much more complex than a mere, the mere naming. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to jump off that one as well? Thank you so much, Rhoda. No, you've all had your say in the matter. Okay. Okay, it's like being in one of my seminars. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, well, better. I can add one more thing because I think um, it's also the question of our current political economies, mm -hmm. and one of the things in terms of. Um, the, the ways in which you know transnational sources of funding operate and how these sources of funding have allowed um, for the circulation of certain terminologies like transgender right um, and it's not to say that there is a kind of it's because of these economies and the sources of funding that you get the adoption of the language around transgender but in fact, there is a correlation there, right? Like as, as groups are positioning themselves, as they are claiming, seeking resources, as they want to be legible, as they want to create solidarities with people outside of the country, um, they, you know, that there is this sort of, again, a kind of complicated nexus that is allowing for the proliferation of some terminologies and not others. So in that sense, you know, they continue to be political um, but, you know, not in ways that I think can be reduced. That's very interesting. And also in terms of the politics of funding, we also see shifts in the funding <clears throat> regimes. So, for example, funding that is no longer available to, for example, women and feminist organizations may now be available to, to our gender and sexuality organizations, and again, under certain, certain constructs. So I think that, um, that especially for those of us who end up being the kind of developmental focus in terms of aid, it, it, it is even more limiting the ways in which this happens. But also I think social media is very powerful and uh, therefore also constructs and identities also certain very widely. And I think it's also up to us to see that as we understand the circulations coming from the north to the south, we need to also understand circulations that can emerge in the south and almost have to also help to clarify uh, our global understanding of these phenomena. Uh, if I could just come in, just something I was thinking about with, um, yeah, you know, like Jyoti said, I don't think, I mean, in my experience, I don't think the use of the terminologies is such a problem, really. Um, and I think the deeper problem really is about um, narratives and stories or experiences and how they are narrated coming out of, um, you know, uh, the Indian language context and then traveling out only if they are translated to English. I mean, for instance, even with fiction, which is something that's, you know, that gets a lot of news um, sort of space in India. Um, I mean, best-selling, a best-selling um, gay writer in Canada, in Bangalore, um, who has sold, whose book has sold 10,000 copies but he is only going to, his book is only going to travel to other languages now because HarperCollins India has decided to pick up his book and translate it to English. And I think 
you know, forget about traveling out of the country. I think these narratives are not even traveling from one part of the country to another. There is such a such a dependence on this sort of, you know, the English language kind of uh, phenomenon being part of the equation. Thank you so much. Any responses, Rada? You want to say something? Yeah, I think I think it's not just the language; it's also the power, the power, the global power structures. Because I mean, we are also English. There's a lot of English language in the global south, but yet our work isn't read either. Our work doesn't travel either. I think there's a hegemony of the North Atlantic, and I think when we go on to the I think this is something that we could probably discuss more later on because I do have something to say about that. Why don't you say it now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I wanted to say is that is that knowledge that is constructed in the north. I mean, I noticed that when I did when I do university, or even now when I read books, many of the books published in the north never identify a site. You know, they speak of like gender and whatever, whatever, but there's no site. And the assumption is that that work is of global relevance. Whereas when we work, let's say India, South Africa, we are humble. We identify the source of our data. And, and, but the situation results therefore that our information, our theorizing, is seen as provincial. It is of local relevance. Our concepts do not have global significance. And I see, and I think, in other words, you have to actually go to the North for your work to have global significance. So I think that is one of the, the big frustrations because as associated with this, that the conceptual ideas that come out of the South, therefore, it's very difficult for them to be engaged with, even though they can add value to global understandings. And I think, for example, uh, Jyoti speaks of the ESA, I'm in the ISA, and these are some of the things that we are, we are questioning, uh, the politics of location and how, how, what, how what is said is even taken up or even read you know, so I think that that, that, is, that is a very important issue. Because I do think that, for example, if that, that a lot of what's happening in Asia in terms of sex, gender and sexualities could really, you know, would, would be really important for some areas of the global north, some of that work that's being done. But, and it would really enrich understanding. So that, that's my point. Thanks so much. One, I, I just wanted to add to that, just from a publishing perspective, Rhoda, that was really interesting because one of the things that I faced again and again after starting Yoda Press was that whenever we published um, academic works in sexuality in India or South Asia, and we sent those manuscripts out to American university presses for them to buy rights, they would invariably come back to me saying, oh, this is too South Asian. You know, this is too South Asian for us. And, and the funniest part is that once Yoda Press has gained a bit of a re reputation, now we are flooded with manuscripts on various uh, uh, academic manuscripts located in South Asia, but by people who are publishing there. You know what I mean? So now that's not too South Asian to send back to me, right? It's just ridiculous. But anyway, that was a great point to me. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's an extension of coloniality when, when you just keep centering Euro-American interests in areas and, uh, and, um, and also particular types of thinking and particular type, types of intellectuals. It's the old rigmarole of what's European, what's American is universal and what's from the rest of the world is local, is provincial, uh, which is colonial tale, right? Col tale as old as time, really. Um, Jyoti, did you, do you want to chime in on, on that debate? No, I mean, you know, that's the sort of the point that I was making in terms of I feel like my work one way or another has had to, and I think so many of us who are working on context in the global south, that that is one of the things that you're constantly pushing back, right? 
we write a chapter, you publish a chapter, you publish a, a journal article, you publish a book, and the sort of the qualifier, India or Caribbean or Africa or you know whatever the, that qualifier is always in the title. Whereas all of the you know the versions that you get from within um, these more hegemonic centers, for some reason that title is not that qualifier is not necessary, right? That there is this constant production as if a title on sexuality that is based in the US, it does not need to announce itself as coming from the US. You know, that there is this sort of implicit understanding that this is about the US, but that it's somehow universal. Um, and that's the problem that I was referring to about, you know, looking at the global south or even the, you know, and by global south, I'm actually not even really talking about geographic, geopolitical sort of, or geographic understandings of it, I'm talking about it in terms of marginalized groups so that the global South exists within the United States or within parts of Western Europe, right? And so if we think about it from that angle, then it seems to me that, you know, we, there is something important about those perspectives that are also about complicating and producing theory. Right, that the theory we need to we need to dis, dismantle we need to decenter a very notion of where theory and by theory I mean like where knowledge is coming from right like where do we understand how do we understand the world becomes so much so centered in very particular perspectives that are claiming to be universal. So, so interesting. I mean, I guess we need to go beyond citing the books that get published in the American university presses and in the British university presses and go elsewhere for an archive, right, and for ideas. Okay. And, and Alberto, I would say also the US, you know, it's one is that we need to diversify and pluralize and, you know, have a broader understanding, but also the university presses here or in Western Europe have to do that work. Right, because it's not a matter of simply adding things. It's a matter of how do we change the very reference point? How do we change that landscape? Thank you so much, such a pressing question. Rhoda, did you want to respond? You just agreeing. You just said yes. I, just... I agree, but I think we also have to actually read and engage with the work. You know, I think that citing it is very nice. But I think in actually engaging with it, debating with it uh, in, in our classes, seeing how it speaks to other work. In other words, you know, seeing its relevance, using the concepts in, 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 an, in, in analysis. So, so I think it's, it's an, an actual engagement that's, that's really necessary. Okay, so, thank you so much. So if somebody else wants to say something else? I, I felt I interrupted someone. No? Okay. Uh, thank you, Yoti, for sending out the reminder to all the all the people watching to send us in any questions. I've seen that some of you have already already very generously answered on the on the Q and A um, section. Thanks so much, Yoti, for the for the very generous discursive um, answers to this written up. I don't know how you managed to multitask, answer my questions, and, and type everything up as well. Um, so would you like me to start engaging with some of the questions here? We've got a question from uh, Farsin Hemazbi for Rhoda. And they say, how does color discrimination affect the different races when it comes to sexual exploitation in the Caribbean in the 21st century? Yes, I think that um, when we speak about white privilege, I think colorism is one of the ways in which it is expressed. And Colorism, of course, is part of the racialized legacy of colonialism and the colonial social and economic structures. But I think we also have to understand that there is a colorism that predated uh, Western capitalism and had a lot to do with status and, and class, if we could use that word, in feudal societies so that what we found, for example, in the, Carib in the Caribbean is that there, there was a racialized color coding system that was established, established by the colonizers and the colonialists 
with the uh, African populations who were enslaved and those that came after. But then we had a large scale uh, importation of Indo Indian uh, laborers who also brought color, notions of color and status. And I think those two things kind of reinforced each other. So, I, so color is definitely a legacy of privilege uh, from various uh, locations, but I think its importance as part of the, the Euro-American domination uh, is, continues to be important. So colorism is also something that gets taken up uh, by, by global capital, the beauty industry, and by colorism, we sometimes don't just refer to shade or color, but also to phenotype. And the fact that, um, that the, the global hair industry, for example, is, is, is a trillion dollar industry, which actually connects women in very uh, unfortunate ways, uh, where, where so much of the human hair purchased by African descendant women in various parts of the world is here that was harvested by Indian women, sometimes who have donated their hair as part of a temple ritual, or by poor women in other parts of the world who sell their hair as part of an economic strategy. So I think the whole question of colorism is a status thing, is it? but it also speaks to larger constructs of inequality, which then feed into the global uh, production cycle. So it's, 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 it's a big one. Thank you so much. I don't think we have any other questions yet. If, if anybody in the audience all across the world has any, do please type them in because we've got, still have plenty of time to discuss with you. Um, Okay, where can we go next? Um, I don't want to kind of impose my, my schedule on any of you. So is there anything that you three feel that you need to get off your chest about this, about uh, decolonizing uh, our fields? I, sorry, I just wanted to answer. I didn't see that. Um, I saw that question about the Pope uh, talking about same-sex marriage, and I just wanted to respond uh, right. to this person that actually it's really interesting that it, he, you know, that this should happen at this time because in India, I mean, just a piece of news, same-sex marriage is now being debated in the High Court, as a matter of fact, um, to same-sex couples who have asked for recognition of their unions and the most, and it's really serendipitous in a sense, because it happened just a day uh, from me, across, away from each other. Um, we first heard that uh, the Delhi High Court had actually uh, referred to the, the matter to the center and to the Delhi government, which of course had all of us saying, oh my God, what is going to come out of this? Because when, 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 when a court refers something like this to the government, then you know that's just like a game, a ping pong game, right? They're just trying to, they don't want to take a stance on anything because you know what the government is going to say. This is a, as Jyoti had pointed out, this is a right wing government. Um, and, and the next day, of course, uh, the Pope's statement came, and for some of you who know that, you know, for instance, um, uh, Goa, um, which has a very large uh, state in India, which has a very large Catholic, Roman Catholic population, um, I think there's so much sort of confusion and interest there, for instance, because they have always been told uh, by their parish priests that uh, this is a problem, and now the Pope has said this, and of course everybody is kind of discussing it, which is great, I guess. Sorry, just wanted to respond to that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let's get a bit wordy because um, um, uh, Yoti, uh, you mentioned you, um, you examined and compared very, very um, usefully the concepts of decolonization and decoloniality. And, um, and uh, you had me thinking about, you know, academic buzzwords and how they become prevalent, you know, the point at which everything suddenly is intersectional and then everything is decolonial. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to my, my postgraduate days when everything became global and all, and all these kinds of things. Um, 
And you said about what is decolonization? You mentioned that that anecdote that really amused me about decolonizing yoga. I'm not quite understanding what the decolonial aspect of it was. Um, so um, I, it had me thinking about some of the post, and, and you did bring bring back the post-colonial, which I love as a post-colonialist, because we always seem to be in a state of solipsism, or, or somebody wants to bury the post-colonialists uh, in the past. Um, but I do remember the time in the 90s when post-colonial discourse was so uh, fixed on, on the concept of being unable to unlearn the legacies of colonial modernity, right? Mm -hmm. And that the past is irrecoverable, you can never get it back. There's no point in going back to pre-colonial times. But I do wonder whether now it is a matter of actually trying to access pre-colonial modes of knowledge and pre-colonial modes also of, uh, of spirit, of mysticism, of, uh, of, of um, you know, different cosmologies. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether we need to go beyond the enlightenment mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and excavate other forms mm -hmm. of knowledge. What do people think about this? So um, thank you for sharing that, Alberto. I think there is a lot in what you just said. Um, so I think at one level, the problem is when things start to, terminology starts to circulate, like decolonize this, decolonize that, um, it becomes virtually meaningless, right? Mm -hmm. Or we really have to very carefully parse out what does it mean in this context? What does it mean in this other context? Like how is the term being deployed? And that's why, you know, I mentioned the decolonized yoga because I actually spent some time there on the website trying to figure out what this is. And my more critical bent says, you know, this is really a kind of rhetorical gesture because when you name it as such, saying that this is about decolonizing yoga, it kind of gives you permission to go on and do what you're going to do anyway. Right, so that it becomes a kind of protective rhetorical gesture and you do you make the gesture and then you move on and practice it. Because if you look at that particular website, um, there is a lot there and you know there is um, there's uh, there's references to race and there's you know about becoming a kind of um, conscious race conscious person lots of articles that have nothing to do with yoga but are about educating around questions of race. So, you know, it's kind of doing all of this work, um, but at the same time, it seems to me the sort of the very problem, the power structures in terms of which bodies are on these websites, who is developing the website, why are there not, you know, like most of the teachers, most of the instructors are still tend to be white, lean women, right? Like there's a particular body type, there's a particular subject that is actually, um, you know, sort of um, making sure that this is circulating. So that's my critical bent. But the more generous part of me also thinks that there is a way in which that these buzzwords, whether it's being used by this side or in academia, that what we're constantly trying to do is to name structures of power, practices, modalities, um, or in Foucault's term, political rationalities of power, right? We're constantly trying to get at them and they seem to be slippery or we're always somehow behind it, right? Behind these formations, how we study them. So we come up with global, but then it still seems inadequate because global and local to begin with, inadequate. Local seems inadequate. And then we come up with transnational and then, you know, transnational doesn't seem to be always doing enough work. So in a sense, our, um, it's about our attempts at um, naming, understanding, and hopefully disrupting structures of power, right? That's, that's what this is about. And then to come to your question about the part about the pre-colonial, the turn to um, or outside of the colonial, because outside of the colonial was not only pre-colonial, but to some level existed alongside the colonial, right? Not every aspect of life was touched in that comprehensive, exhaustive way um, as perhaps certain other parts of life were. So it seems to me that that is an important endeavor as long as we understand that there is no innocent place from which we can recover 
or understand, right? That there is a certain political project that is even motivating at this point our attempts to understand and recover to whatever extent that is recoverable. Um, so always being mindful of the fact that there isn't a place of innocence or a kind of political neutrality, right? Or even our relationship to history, there's nothing neutral about it. And, um, and that these projects are constantly being filtered. And one last point that I would like to make is also about the ways in which, and the subaltern studies and other, um, you know, sort of um, some of the thinking coming out of Latin America, as well as around slavery has helped us think through the point, the ways in which we turn to the subaltern, right? And fetishize the subaltern in order to somehow justify our own political projects or our own political purposes. And I think that's problematic too. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Any responses from Arpita Rauda to that? Yes. Arpita, do you want to go ahead? No, you go first, Rhoda. You go okay, first. I, I, I wanted to say that um, the whole decolonial turn has been very interesting. But I think the most important aspect to me has to be the, the work that has to be done in Europe and North America. And in other words, I think that um, it's not just we who have to be decolonized. We've been struggling with that for centuries. But I think that the, the work that has to be done within uh, the centers of the North Atlantic are also critical. So I've been really um, uh, moved by some movements, for example, in Germany that have sought to, of young people uh, trying to identify the colonial roots within their communities. I know of one group that organizes decolonial tours of, of Frankfurt and also of the neighboring city and of Gisan. In other words, trying to sensitize the current population on their colonial heritage and their connections with the whole experience of coloniality. I was also impressed with the ways in which Columbus, you know, featured in the Black Lives Matter <clears throat> debate. So I think that uh, the whole fact of coloniality within the colonizing and colonial po powers and in those societies, I think are very important aspects of this term, this term. And therefore I think it, it establishes that connection and that recognition of that unequal relationship. And it in a way shifts some of the questions away from why sh of blaming uh, countries for their positions without taking into consideration the whole colonial and neo-colonial experience. So I wanted to mention that. Thank you so much, Rhoda. Arpita? Yeah, I, just, I was just thinking that when we're talking about, I mean, after a certain amount of cynicism with words like decolonizing, I think now we're at a political moment in India, at least, where the word has become important again. I think I think Jyoti made a reference to it earlier as well. And I think where we are at the moment, uh, when we are trying desperately to understand where, how we got here, and um, and trying to understand the the origins of this movement, which has now become a government and a you know a, a, a kind of government that that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then makes one want to know how it all began, um, and and um, so I think I think these terms have become really important again. And even if in some circles there is some amount of tokenism or lip service happening, I'm all right with that. I feel that you know uh, there just has to be much more discussion. I think part of the reason is that there was such a cleavage between also the academic and the lay uh, person. And uh, for such a long time, when it came to words of this sort, and what did we mean by it? What were people in the academic circles talking about? And why didn't they ever want to care about talking about it in a way which, you know, lay people were going to go out there and vote 
uh, can understand better. And somehow, well, because I'm positioned somewhere in the middle, that is a problem and that is a, 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 that's a question I have to wrestle with all the time when, when I'm working. And, um, and, and some of that plays a role in where we find ourselves now. It has to be said, you know, to simply say that Ram, this, the figure, the religious figure of Ram, this God Ram, was ahistorical, so forget about him, which is what the leftist liberals did right through the time when I was in college, for instance. That was not going to have, that was finally going to lead to this. Because they, there was just such a terrific disconnect between what our Marxist historians felt was, you know, in their ivory towers that they had said it. They had said the final word. Nobody gave a damn. And we are where we are now, right? So I'm okay with these words if uh, academics unpack them in a way that, um, that they waft out of the ivory towers a little bit. And the other thing about your pre-colonial point, that scares me a little these days because a lot of the right-wing project in India has harked back to the pre-colonial. Of course, they have very quickly skipped over medieval Indian history and gone right back to this imagined ancient past, right? And so I, uh, uh, the minute that that sends uh, sort of uh, alarm bells, uh, gets alarm bells ringing for me. So, yeah. That's really good. I mean, that, that connects with what Jyoti said about how decolonization can be right wing and how yes. Dutva in India, you know, is, is uh, you know, it poses as traditionalism, mm -hmm. but actually, as you said, it's a very selective understanding of the nation and of mm -hmm. Indian history as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, start breaking hierarchies even here, and I want to bring to the general discussion Stephanie's uh, question. In, uh, in the chat box because she, uh, uh, a, te a technical organizer who's, who's here listening to all of us, she, she posed a question about uh, her research. So I wanted to invite her to join the conversation. So if you don't feel too exposed, unmute yourself, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, if it's okay, I'll, I'll keep yeah, my mean. camera off. Okay. Yeah. So my research is looking at um, housing transient African descended men um, and doing a case uh, study in Boston. Um, and my supervisor suggested that I read Rhoda's work in particular because of the ways that her and her colleagues in the Caribbean um, look at policy and programs, government sponsored programs that seek to engage with uh, sort of specifically pathologized mm -hmm. African descended men in the Caribbean, um, probably like used the um, boys who cause issues or who have troubles mm -hmm. in, in school. And so I was really interested in thinking of the Caribbean as a, a Caribbean pro um, based programs as case studies for how to engage youth that, that especially black men who are pathologized in the North, specifically in the US, um, mm. and how these programs are structured mm. and the lessons that can be learned and applied in the global North, specifically in the US in the context of my research. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Anybody want to respond or react? Yes, I can say that, um, that the whole field of masculinity studies, I think this is one area where in the Caribbean, we began working this much earlier than elsewhere. And this is where, and I remember attending a session of the International Sociological Association. Uh, and there were all these scholars from Northern Europe who were discovering this phenomena in 2014, when we had actually begun work on it as early as 1986. Because in 1986, one of our professors, Aaron Miller, published his landmark study, The Marginalization of the Black Male, Lessons from the Teaching Profession, when he sought his own explanation for the phenomenon where in the English-speaking Caribbean, uh, it is stated that women, girls outperform boys in the education system. And I think at that time, the university and on the Jamaica campus was over 80% female. And there was a great deal of angst about the situation of black males. And in fact, he 
he put forward his own theory where he argued that the colonial, colonial officials are afraid of the black males in the teaching profession sought to advance female teachers as a way of counteracting the power of the black males. So in other words, what we're already seeing, we're already seeing there was the beginning of masculinist backlash. And the contradictory thing about masculinist backlash in that it identified a very real problem, a very real issue, but the way in which it, it addressed it was a way that actually blamed women and actually suggested that women were privileged by colonialism and given no recognition of women's agency or actions. So I think that coming out of this and responding to this uh, marked the beginning of masculinity studies in the English speaking Caribbean and the contradictions of dealing with concerns, for example, uh, what the language that Stephen used, the pathologizing of the black male and the contradictions of challenging patriarchal ideas of masculinity, which of course intersect with racialized constructs. So I think this is a, an area where intersectionality becomes very important. And for feminist scholars in understanding how we approach this complex issue, uh, it meant that we had to be, we had to understand the varying factors, the, the colonialism, the neocolonialism, the, the patriarchy, as well as the racisms that exist in, in the society. So I think that in our region, uh, we, we ended up doing a lot of work on education, but also introducing courses. In fact, the first conference we had, with, which I organized was in 1996. And I remember I couldn't get the book because the publishers, including the male publishers, couldn't really understand what this book was about. And but nevertheless, I think that uh, that feminist engagement with masculinities is critically important in that masculinity is defined oppositionally. And we also, but at the same time, we also need to, to develop the mechanisms to address the issues that emerge because of the intersection of class and race, but also to provide the, the, the radical and the critical edge that critiques the toxic forms of masculinity that exist. Thank you so, so much. We do have policies, Stephanie, and maybe later on we could discuss some of what has been tried. Okay, thank you, Rhoda. We have, uh, well, the Q&A section is very, very lively and healthy at the moment. Uh, we've got Anna, I mean, I'll read a few of the questions so you can respond to them as you see fit. Mm -hmm. Anna says, as a young person in a Eurocentric education system, what can make sure, how can we make sure that we don't fall into those perspectives? I'm assuming she means colonial ones. And even challenge the ways that we are taught. So that's what she's asking. Uh, Liang Dong says, I feel that uh, decolonization works, works need to value the voice outside Euro-American centric context. So I wonder what other decolonizing projects in Europe and America um, are doing to engage with the works by Asian scholars or, or community members and activists doing the groundwork and construct methods informed mm -hmm. by their experiences in gender sexuality and power hierarchy. Can any of you speak to that? Uh, are there any Eastern mm -hmm. Asians or South, Southeast Asians um that are relevant to the to you know works that are relevant to the to the work that we, we should be doing that should be enough for now so i can begin with the first question and uh which is about the eurocentric education system and how we make sure we don't fall into those perspectives Thank you so much. i think at one level it's really about mm -hmm. um making sure that we educate ourselves Fortunately, it's a lot easier to find sources um, to do that work, um, you know, just because of the availability of technology, which was so much harder to do 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so I think we have uh, just a wealth of resources at this point. And so educate yourself, ask yourself, why are you learning what you're learning? 
just because something is from a Eurocentric viewpoint doesn't mean that it gets dismissed, right? Like what is of worth, what is of value there? But certainly if everything that you're reading or the majority of what you're reading is from a Eurocentric viewpoint or the syllabus that you're reading is being actually promoted or has been produced from a Eurocentric viewpoint, then certainly that's a problem. So educate yourself, but also, you know, make alliances with other people around you, other students who are taking these courses, make alliances and ask as a collective, as a group, ask your instructors and your professors why you're learning what you're learning. And to say simply that you have to learn such and such um, theorists because that's just part of the canon, that's not good enough of a response because the canon is always changing, right? And that's part of the effort that has been going on in the last 40, 50 years to really try to rethink the very canon in terms of in disciplinary areas, who belongs in this canon and why. So I think pushing back and actively um, engaging or being aware of the fact that there is a politics around education is, I think, the first and foremost step. Thank you so much. Rhoda, do you want to say something, add something? You just unmuted yourself. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, <laughs> not really. I think Jyoti did a very good job. Uh, I just think that, that um, yeah, I think Jyoti did a very good job. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Arpita, do you have anything to add? No. Jyoti said it perfectly. I can just add, you know, buy more, uh, get more source, not buy, access more reading from South Asia and Latin America mm -hmm. and the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. And it's all so much more accessible and available, like Jyoti said, than when we were doing our studies back 15, 20 years ago. So yeah, just access them and, and push back, challenge your professors, you know, I think that's important. The question about South Asian and Southeast Asian is, I think, is possibly a bit uh, too specific. Um, um. I'll bet I can take a pass at it. And one just sort of quick point, I think for some of us academics, um, the availability, the openness of knowledge has been an important part of, it's, a, it's an important principle. And for me, it was really important that my last book um, sexual states is part of the open access. So anybody can just sort of Google it. Um, you can just look it up and, you know, the, the entire book in PDF form is available. So I think whatever we can do collectively in order to encourage that kind of open access, um, even as I'm mindful that publishing companies need to be able to stay alive and, you know, um, that there is a um, financial consideration there. So just wanted to make that pitch. In terms of the Southeast Asia, there is a lot of work going on and I would just really encourage you to, again, do some searches, see the kind of work that you are looking for, the kinds of sources that you're looking for. But two names that I can mention to you right away, um, people I think who've done really tremendous work. Uh, one is Eng Beng Lim, who is at Dartmouth College, and the other person um, has written this book, Geisha of a Different Kind, see Winter Han. So these might be two sources in terms of at least academic <laughs> studies that could be very good starting points. Um, but beyond that, there <laughs> are other activist groups that are artists that you may want to actually look up and see the kind of work that they are doing. So I hope that's helpful. That's really generous. Thank you so much. I do have, I, I myself have been exploring the concept of transversality in the last year and a bit. And I've copied and pasted a, a book by a Huayo Young called Transversal Relationality and Intercultural Texts. Um, and he's trying to cut across Eastern and, and Western philosophies. So my own piece of advice as someone who's trying to go to see beyond my own, uh, my own cosmology is think across boundaries think across boundaries of, of, you know, of sexual orientation, of, of, uh, of uh, racial and ethnic identity, of nationality, um, and try to look beyond uh, a Eurocentric education. Um, and as, as Yoti really put really well, um, 
resources right now are, are um, you know, most, we didn't have this kind of digital sources back uh, uh, probably just like two, two decades ago. So the knowledge is at your fingertips if you have a, an, an institution, an institutional affiliation. So read widely and read beyond the Euro-American canon, basically, is what I would say. So, um, okay. I do realize that we are running out of time. We've got 10 minutes left. Uh, let me see. Um, Somebody okay, no, I think there was one. Did we respond to this? Oh, oh. there was one. Oh, at the very bottom. Yes, you're yeah, right. and I think Rhoda is possibly going to respond to it. Oh, excellent. Yes. Does decolonization mean going back to the origin? meaning India, Africa, etc. What about Creole societies? What does decolonization mean for them? Really good question, actually. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I think it's never possible to go back in a real sense. I think what we can do is uh, try to understand uh, phenomena anthropologically, historically, sociological, as much as we can to understand our own societies in the past, but also in the present to listen to people. I think that, for example, when we were doing that work on sexuality, the ethnography, and you just talk to people, it was amazing the conceptualizations and the complexities that they brought forward, things we didn't even think about, that we then had to try to put in some sort of order or system. But, but the, the ideas coming out from many of the people who really amazing analyses that we had not really thought of. So I think that also going back can be very dangerous as we mentioned before, because going back often assumes some sort of fundamentalist or original location, which is not always very equitable or, uh, or, or, or equitable on, or safe. So that I think that what we have to do is learn the lessons of the past and the present and understand the ways in which coloniality has shaped and continues to shape our lives and to seek to develop new ways of praxis and of our understanding. I think also there are, there are, there are ideas from the past that still have resonance that we can use to enrich our understanding and our strategies for the future. And to really critically look at, for example, in the Caribbean now, we have accepted a request for reparations, which for years uh, was something that was debated a lot. People said, okay, if you have reparations, so what happens is it that you give everybody $100. But we realized that reparations would also be uh, first of all, an accountability mechanisms, whereby the countries that have benefited so much, and there's so much research now about how the wealth, for example, in Britain, the royal family, the big banks, how much that legacy of enslavement has enriched, and how widespread slave owning was in the society, to have a degree of, of, of accountability and maybe an apology and some effort at reparations. To me, that is a very nice old fashioned concept that would continue to have relevance today and could begin to heal some of the wounds that have been established in the colonial period. So I think that we go back, but more or less to reflect, to learn, and to use that information to go forward. Very inspiring words. Thank you so much. Do uh, we have any final thoughts? Um, can we leave with a kind of, is, is there any point in leaving with a message of hope for the, any, anybody watching? I mean, where do we go from here in terms of decolonizing our disciplines and the work that we do? What do you see yourselves as the next few steps or the next step? Um, Arpita, would you like to go forward? Yeah, I'm going to repeat everything I've said before. <laughs> um, why don't you go first? Um, just one quick thought about the question of Creole societies to add to Rhoda's excellent point. <laughs>
points. You know, one thing that I found useful um, mm -hmm. is looking at some of the work around creolization as a concept mm -hmm. and or hybridity as a concept. Mm -hmm. And I think when we look at it from that angle, it seems like just about every social context that we know is deeply creolized or deeply hybridized, mm -hmm. right? And I understand that you may be using the, the uh, our, uh, our, our person here might be using it in a more precise way, but I'm using it I'm opening it up more conceptually mm -hmm. and that, you know, so my point is simply this, that the question you're asking could be asked of virtually any context mm -hmm. um, because all contexts at some level are hybrid. There isn't, you know, that's like that myth of purity mm -hmm. is really that it is a myth and um, societies across the history have been deeply, um, mm -hmm have been interacting in so many different ways for the most part, right? Except for people who have been completely outside of it. Um, but to your, uh, to your excellent question, Alberto, in terms of steps going forward, uh, for me, as I think I was saying at the very end of my talk, decolonization is an ongoing project. And it's something that I'm, you know, sort of my own work, my own thinking, my own teaching is deeply invested in. And I, I'm working on a project right now on death and migration. This is about South Asian migration to North America and questions of death that were um, really part of this and how they dealt with all of that. Um, and the kinds of histories of racism and control that that angle opens up for us. But for me, what has been really important is to place these South Asian histories in relationship to other marginalized communities, whether it is African-Americans, whether it is indigenous histories, um, whether it is uh, migrants from China or um, other parts of Asia. And so, and that requires, I don't, I don't know this work. I, you know, this is not what I read as a graduate student. This is not the work I spent doing the last 20 years. So my, the reason I'm sharing this is that sort of that process of educating mm -hmm. ourselves is ongoing. Mm -hmm. That commitment to decolonizing and decentering these European Eurocentric perspectives mm -hmm. is ongoing, but it's also something that we have to do collectively. Mm -hmm. It's not about individual scholars and it's a project that we have to share across the generations and across the various fields um, for this to be really successful. Scholars, activists, publishers, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. It's something that I think is, has to be done collectively. Oh, I just wanted to apologize for forgetting that section of the question and Jyoti did an excellent job, but I just wanted to agree with her, but also that there are certain what I call post-colonial multi-ethnic societies that raise different questions, for example, in relation to the concept of intersectionality. And I'm sorry that we didn't really get a chance to go into this because it's something that I, I had planned to discuss. I well, we're have it long enough. Uh, well, that's as much time as we've had. So uh, I can't thank you enough. It's been a really uh, stimulating discussion and we probably could have continued for another two hours, but uh, we probably would have been brain dead by the end of them. <laughs> After all this concentration, I find, I find Zoom really kind of like energy consuming. Uh, but thank you so much, Harpita, Yoti and Rhoda for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, look after yourselves and everybody else, please. Um, there's a link to the next event in the chat box. Uh, a stage conversation, uh, Lady Sue Punch uh, book talk by Yasmin Ali Pali Brown. So if you could make it over, um, otherwise, have a good end of the day and have a good weekend ahead. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. you. Fabulous. My pleasure. Thank you. So much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank bye you so everyone. much. You too. Bye, Roda. Bye, Roda. Bye, Roda. Bye, Roda. Bye, Roda. Thank you, Alberto. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye now.